everybody, welcome back to the Accommodation Show. I am pumped this week because we are joined by Jeff Brown from Loma Homes. You may remember roughly around about uh, two or three months ago, we had Brindy Barton on the show and she was talking to us about extreme themed accommodation. Now, this week we are joined by Jeff, who is uh, Brindy's business partner, who will be helping us walk through some of the technical details of what they do. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah, look, um, I love what you guys do as a business. I love the brand. Um, if there's property managers out there looking to build a brand, or even if you're a boutique accommodation owner and you're looking to build a brand, or even if you're a big hotel, you should look at the branding that these guys are coming up with because what they've done is they've come up with a theme and they've decided to run with it. Um, first off, let's just start off with that. Um, I would, uh, actually no, let's start off with a bit of an introduction. How about you introduce yourself, then after you introduce yourself, could you tell us a little bit about um, Loma Homes and why you guys decided to pivot or focus on one particular theme? Yeah, absolutely, it's a good question. So. Um, I came from the tech startup world. Uh, I worked for a company called One Click Retail, and there we did uh, analytics for companies that sold on Amazon. So we provide a lot of data. Um, it was there I gained a lot of experience in data analysis. Uh, in fact, my whole career has really been in, in analytics. So I was able to kind of apply that lens to the short-term rental space. I, uh, our first property was in Joshua Tree, California, which is a few hours from where I lived, which most people would consider kind of gutsy, right? And in not investing right in my backyard. Um, but it really came from just analyzing the numbers and seeing that Joshua Tree had a, a high potential for revenue and a low cost of housing. Um, and I partnered up with uh, this flipping couple. They were um, real estate flippers that uh, were flipping homes all across the country. And I thought, you know what? If they could help me get a property up in Joshua Tree, then I would pay them for it, uh, guarantee them a paid you know, get a purchase price, and we could we could work it out. And it, it did work out. Uh, the property made enough profit that they looked at me and said, "Well, what are we doing?" Um, and the rest is history. We decided to, to start a full time our full full time business, and uh, we I quit my full time job. They quit their flipping business, and we just went all in on Loma Homes. Um, so that's really kind of our company story. And then in terms of why we picked the themes, when I, when I was running my numbers, um, what, Orlando was an area that kept coming up over and over again as a, as a profitable spot. And as I looked into why that was, I could see that theming was a very popular way to get a lot of revenue. And so, um, but when you look at Orlando and anyone that's looked at Orlando can tell you that there are tens of thousands of vacation rentals in that space. So if you're going to be competitive, you need to be unique or be the best. And, and I, I got advice a long time ago from somebody who said, if you can't be the best, be unique. Mm. And that's probably been the best business advice I've ever gotten <laughs> because when you look at the best properties and they weren't the most profitable, meaning they might make the most revenue. They're like 15 bedroom mansions, and, but they probably cost $5 million and they don't make enough revenue to offset that. Um, but being the most unique is where the profit margins seem to be. And that's really where we focused on themes is you know, in the Orlando space, we build basically theme park homes where people are having extensions of the theme park. Um, we have another location near the beach where people are having beach experiences. They're themes, they're still themed, but they're not the same theme park level. Why? Because people aren't going to the beach for a theme park experience, they're going for a beach experience. And so that's, that's what we've created with Loma Homes as a brand that um, is all about experiences. Yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome explanation of, of why to do it. Um, and I've always been uh, enamored with how eye-catching your properties are. And if you're trying to find, to create that USP and find that something that stands out there is it's very hard for someone else to replicate exactly what you're doing and even if they're replicating they don't even have to replicate exactly the same thing um i can see this space growing in terms of the extreme themed homes um it'll be interesting also to see whether there's sort of a peak in that in that sort of uh, demand and then whether, whether it'll tail off or whether you guys have to kind of keep and reinventing the brand but the great thing about what you do is you can keep on reinventing and you can say, hey, this project's here for five years, and in five years, we're gonna have to uh, scrap it and start again. Um, but uh, 
yeah, fascinating story. Um, I love the approach. I love where you've come from. I like the fact, because we get all sorts of guests on this show. And we get guests that are from um, real estate. We get guests that are from sort of hotels, hospitality. And then we get people like yourself that are maybe not be so uh, hospitality focused within their careers, but more, I really know numbers. I really know the analytics. I really have attention to detail in that way. And like you said, you, you, there were skills that you didn't have where you got people to help you out with it. And then you're like, I know I can run these numbers. I know how to do this research. So that's what we're going to be covering today. We're going to be talking about a bit of that research, a bit about okay. understanding target markets and a bit about profitability, about scaling your business and that sort of thing. One of the things that you said was, um, you went, you looked at the Orlando market and you saw that it was super busy and then you decided you, you saw that it was profitable. Um, can you kind of break that down a little bit for us? Can you break down? How do you figure out whether an area is profitable? So the first thing, yeah, we use, um, different third party platforms to collect data and estimate profitable areas. So most people have heard of air DNA. Um, and we do use air DNA for high level market analysis. So if you've ever heard of AirDNA.co, you can go in there and you can, um, or even if, even if you don't want to buy anything, they have blogs that they write about most profitable places to invest in 2020, 2021 or 2022. And they've already broken it out for you. So we actually took that list and said, okay, well, let's, let's, uh, let's start to use this to start to narrow down our search and um orlando or florida just kept coming up over and over again in all their lists they're like well let's, there's something here let's check it out so air dna is great for high level we don't use it for the more specific uh granular detail because at least when we compare our data to air dna it just doesn't seem to be quite as accurate so that's where um we take um we go into a software called price labs they're they're uh a uh well, they're a pricing software, they automate your pricing, but they also do some market dashboards with their data, which are really helpful. And that's where we really start to drill in and estimate the amount of revenue per bedroom size for these, for these areas that we're looking into. Um, and then we just uh, use some ratios that we've determined, and I'm happy to share those with you if you want. Um, but we use some ratios to just say, okay, look, uh, for us to make a profit, we need to make, uh, the house can't cost any more than X. Mm -hmm. So then we look at Zillow or whatever and say, oh, well, it looks like the houses fit within that range. This is a good area. So what part of that do you want to drill more into? Yeah, right. So that was actually that my second question was going to be exactly that. So how do we figure out what area we're actually meant to invest in um, and then figure out those numbers? So um, do you have sort of ballpark figures that people can start to work with in terms of figuring yeah. this stuff out? And actually, before we go into the numbers, actually, I think a, a higher level question is really important. And that is sort of what's, what's the business model that Loma Home uses and why? And by business model, I mean, typically, and, and for those of you that, that aren't aware of these, so within short term rentals, you have the arbitrage model which is where you're leasing a property and then putting it onto Airbnb, where generally you're kind of acting like a tenant. Um, you'll typically sign a contract for a year to three years, and then you'll use it for Airbnb. You've got the property management model, which is you um, have a, a, an owner that's furnished the property, and then you'll go in and manage it for them and then take a commission. And then the third model is you buy the property um, and then put it onto Airbnb. So, um, a lot more capital, uh, down and there's benefits and downsides to each of the business models. And some of them have bigger downsides and some have bigger benefits. Uh, but what are, what are you guys doing? Yeah. So we're, um, we're acquiring the asset itself. So we, we get investor capital to help us buy properties. Um, and then we renovate those properties into professionally designed, um, curated, uh, unique properties uh, and then we manage them uh, so we're actually a property management we, we in fact if you look at our entity it's actually split so we have one entity for property management we have another entity for asset uh, holding um, and we have another asset you know we have all different entities for the different functions of our business so they can be sold eventually 
uh, in piecemeal. Mm -hmm. um, but that has a lot of advantages uh, that we can talk about if you'd like. But we, the reason we decided to do that was because we wanted to create a brand in the vacation rental space that um, people could recognize. If you go to, um, if you go rent a, or uh, get a hotel, you know there's certain brands that are going to give you an experience you can expect, like Marriott. Like you know, there's names you recognize, um, and it's heavily consolidated. Versus the vacation rental space, people know Airbnb, they know vac they know VRBO, but within that, who are the big brands that you know you can trust? Right, mm -hmm. and that's what we're out there to create is a brand that people recognize and say, "Whoa, I know every time I go to a Loma Homes property, it's going to be over the top, and it's going to be incredible customer service, and it's going to be clean, and it's going to be all those things." So we're in order to do that, really, you, we felt like we had to own the inventory so that we could create the, curate the experiences that we were looking for. Yeah, okay, that makes complete sense. So, uh, so you're you're buying the properties and doing it in that particular way. Now, I'm not going to use this episode to um, to discuss the advantages of, of buying versus the arbitrage and all that kind of thing. But I can completely understand, especially with your business model, where you need to go in and do some major changes to the property. Then you need to have that control to be able to make to to, to make potentially structural changes and, and change things up. So that makes sense to me. Um, and then kind of and then in terms of running the numbers is I think the other interesting part which we're about to cover. So how do we figure out whether it's going to be profitable and how do we strategize around that? Yeah. So once you've picked a market that you like and that you think will be profitable and that works with your strategy. Um, and you know, obviously, making sure that the regulations in the area are, are accommodating and that thing. Um, once you've picked your area, then it's about determining your max purchase price. Um, and the way we do that is, like I said, we use Price Labs to determine what the average revenue is per home size. So you can pretty quickly determine average revenue for a five-bedroom in. Uh, Panama City Beach is going to be a hundred grand, say for example. So if the revenue is a hundred grand, then what you do is you take your revenue number and you divide it by 0.15. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do that, you'll come up with your max purchase price. Uh, because what we're saying is we call it the 15% rule. If if your revenue is at least 15% of your purchase price, mm -hmm. you're going to make a profit on that home. Now. I will say that we use a, we call it the 20% rule because we actually because we have investors we have, we split it a lot of ways um, we have to be more profitable than the average um, and we manage it to do that but for most people if you're managing it yourself and all those things 15% is going to be plenty and that's kind of the rule you can use to make sure that you're buying and and being profitable every time. Yeah, wow. Okay, cool. So the, the math book is, it seems to be relatively straightforward. How do we make sure that we're, we're getting it right before we even buy it, that it's going to be the, the, the hundred grand that we're going to be making in terms of profit? So, and we're, we're talking about profit, right? We're not talking about uh, revenue. I am talking revenue. Yeah. Oh, revenue. Okay. So yep. yeah, revenue is a lot easier to determine, right? There's a lot less variables sure. in revenue. Um, and for that, we just use Price Labs, and we, we try to, you know, you can use this third-party software to estimate the revenue and making sure that you've got a good size sample. You're not looking at two properties and expecting that to be your average, but if you're looking at the average, you're looking at 20 to 50 to 100 properties to make sure that you've got a good sample, right? Um, yeah. So that's a pretty safe way, and then we always look at the platform itself to, to validate those numbers and say, all right, well, it's saying that we can make 100 grand a year, um, let's look. Let's look at some specific properties, and let's see how much they're booked. Let's see what they're charging, and just just kind of gut check and make sure that you're you're looking at the, those numbers from multiple angles. Um, but yeah, it's really it's really quite simple. It's revenue uh, divided by purchase price to get your your percentage rule. Yeah, gotcha. So and then um, so then when we look at those tools, be it Price Labs, AirDNA, Wheelhouse. So just just for those of you that don't know, so what they they can do is they can do comp sets for you. So you're comparing your property to whatever else is in the area, and that's going to help you determine um, how much you might be able to achieve. So for example, it'll tell you you put in data and say I'm looking in this particular area. It's a three bedroom place, so therefore I can sleep six people. It's got a pool. 
it has a large screen TV and all of these extras that you can put in and then it'll kind of spit out a number and say, hey, this is where we think you are in the market. And we can also tell you roughly occupancy in the area um, so then you can get a good idea of the numbers. Now, um, that's all good and well if you're kind of looking like for like. So, you know, if you're looking at, at, at hotel rooms in the city, easy, right? If you're looking at things that are more unique, how, where you guys are starting to extreme theme and change things up, how can you make a determination as to how well you're going to do and where does the extreme theming fit into this equation? Yeah, that is such a good question because it is one question that we battled with ourselves when we got started. Um, we had no idea what to expect and we, we tried to set our expectations low. Um, but there are there are always some properties that you can comp against, especially in like Orlando, where there's a lot of themed properties out there now. I mean, when we started, there were there were some, but not nearly to the level that there are today. And um, you can in these different platforms, you can see the top performing properties and see what they're doing. Um, but nothing is, especially when it comes to theming, there is a level of quality that is all across the board. And that quality makes a big difference in your revenue. So in our case, uh, I, you know, I'm obviously biased. I don't know if there, I don't feel like there's a lot of theming companies out there doing the same level of quality. Um, but we typically see somewhere between two to three times the revenue that our that an average home would see, uh, assuming the same size, assuming same area, same neighborhood, same everything. We typically do it about two to three times revenue uh, of those. And so that's. That's a number that we've been able to determine for us, uh, but it really, you know, that's because of our, of exactly what we do. And I don't know if that would necessarily be applicable to, to everybody, if that makes sense. Yeah, look, uh, it, it almost seems overwhelming to me because you, you've, you're doing this unique thing and you're building up a brand and um, you're kind of breaking the mold of what everybody else is doing to create more revenue and then you're kind of at more risk because if you don't get it right and you've put in dinosaurs when, when people wanted wanted spaceships or they, yeah. they you know they wanted a crypto themed <laughs> hideout or whatever yeah. and then and then you get it wrong you know like that that would be my biggest fear is because the, it's capital intensive to get to do a project like what you guys are talking about and obviously yes. you know i'm sure that people here could hit you up and team up with you and invest in what you guys are doing but if if you're on your own and you want to kind of figure it out um how do you do your research and and mm -hmm. try to get get yourself a bit more on a bit of a narrower path and i'm sure by the way this um this is coming through as a load question because i know that you've got the uh the experience from one click retail uh, to sort of bring into this how, how do we figure things out how do we how do we get a bit more uh, certainty in terms of the decisions that we're making it's such a great question um, the, I'll say there's two main methods that we use um, one is more qualitative I'd say and one is more quantitative um, and the quantitative way is to look at your area and find all the, as many five-star reviews as you can of the best performing properties you can find and just read them. Um, and what you're looking for is the first part of the review usually says something to the effect of, we came for a blank. You'll see a lot of times in reviews, people say, we came for a bachelorette party. We came for a birthday party. We came for a family reunion. And it was the perfect place because of fill in the blank, right? And that is a wealth of information that people should be using to identify what people like about this area um, and tally it up, you know, use these keywords and count how many times people mention these different things. What we did actually, we, we actually scraped, uh, we, we collected this data systematically and got thousands of five-star reviews in an area and we threw it into a text analyzer and determined how many times these different words were appearing in five-star reviews. Um, if you do this for like Nashville, for example, you'll see the word bachelorette and bachelor party come up over and over and over again. And we actually looked into Nashville to, to invest and we thought, oh, I'm not sure that we want to build bachelorette uh, hangouts and I'm not sure we necessarily want that crowd in our properties. And so um, we decided not to invest there, but 
that's really the secret to understanding what works in your area is gathering that qualitative or quantitative data and focusing, letting that narrow in your niche. Um, and then the qualitative way I'd say is, is more, um, is easier once you've built kind of a following on social media, but we, we go out to our followers on social media and say, Hey, what do you want? Mm. What would be cool? And, um, people throw out the coolest ideas sometimes and, um, we don't take all of them necessarily, but it definitely leads you in the right direction. And you take those and then you can throw out a poll and say, okay, these are the top three. What do you think? And people get a vote on them. And we do that all the time. And, and that also helps people get really engaged in building the property because they can see that their decisions are having an effect on what the property ends up becoming. And that's really fun for, for our followers is we do take a lot of their input. And when we're in the progress of a property, we say, hey, do you like this bedspread or this one? And sometimes we pick the ones that they, that they like. So it's, it's just kind of a fun process. And, and on that note, I mean that that part there. So I'm going to cover both both aspects of what you've talked about because it's invaluable information. It's so useful and so easy. It's so easy to do this. It takes literally minutes, and you can get such useful information. So one of the things that you could do in terms of that you said once you've got a following, then you can you can ask the question. The great thing is with Facebook, you don't even need a following. You just go into any of the Airbnb groups and like um, my group, you could go in there, you could put up a poll, you could put up a, um, you go into Canva, take three or four different themes that you're thinking about or three or four concepts, three or four ideas. It can be whatever you're doing. Go to the group and say, I've got these four options. Which one would you pick and why? And people will engage with it because people engage with content, which is really easy to respond to. So they'll go, as long as you're not making them work too hard, you can't go and say, what would be your best, uh, what kind of themes would you like? They won't do that. But if you give them four different options, they'll go, well, I'll choose number two or three or whatever. And then you can start to engage with them, uh, get more ideas, get more feedback. And this goes everywhere from um, theming a property all the way through to what bottle of wine you should pick um, for the guests or uh, what lock system you're going to use. So all of those things, when you've got questions like that, um, one of the best ways to get the feedback is to do a, a comparison between um, one option and another option. Just asking a big, broad question doesn't tend to work. Um, and I see that you guys also do a lot of those kind of posts as well to sort of kind of check in and say, hey, this is what we're working on. This is uh, do you guys like what we're doing? Uh, and that seems to get a lot of traction across different Facebook groups. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the other part of it was, was pure, um, analytics and that's purely from where you come from in your background in terms of sourcing those reviews and getting those keywords. Um, and this is another uh, piece of advice that you will, you will get if you're doing search engine optimization, if you're doing a competitor analysis as well. So a lot of it is actually just going out there, typing into Google, you know, best themed accommodation in blah area, and then you're going to get some search results on that. And then you're going to start to guide yourself. Um, this is in search engine optimization. That's what you do. You go out, you look at what the competitors are doing, what keywords they're ranking for, what search terms they're ranking for. And then at that point you can start to put together a bit of a strategy, which you think is going to work for you or beat them to the punch and become a little bit stronger. So that's what you're doing there. And I'm assuming as well that you could also, if you wanted to go, you know, uh, really in depth, you've got the reviews, but you could also go deep into the listings and get more and more data out of there to start to run, to run that as well. So yeah. two awesome tips, really appreciate those. Okay. So is there anything else that we're missing on this particular topic? Um, I would say the, the only thing missing here is it really has to do with marketing 101, which is understand your demographic and you need to build a profile for who your guest is. Um, if it's bachelorette parties, then, you know, is that, what age is that? What, what, what does that bachelorette like to watch? What do they like to do? Um, and that will help you shape your experience that you create for them. Um, you know, if it's elderly people, well then maybe USB phone chargers next to every bedside aren't as important, right? But if you're, um, really tailoring to mom, which is our, our graph, our demographic is mom 25 to 35 with kids between the ages of five and 15, right? And so that really helps you get specific in your experience that you're creating and, and really make sure that you're niching down, 
uh, and, and serving the guests that you want to serve. Yeah, so on that, that's a that's a really interesting topic and I think a nice little segue into uh, scaling the businesses. And this is something that I touched on with Brindy before, but didn't want to kind of drill you guys. The, the business model in general, um, I guess that there's unlimited scale because uh, there's there's a there's an extreme demand for uh, these themed homes, especially kids, parties, that sort of thing. But then in terms of scaling, um, you know, there's only so many you guys will be able to build in a year, right? Like without building big teams, and then your your expenses will kind of far outweigh um, what you're capable of delivering. Um, let's talk about investment scaling. Uh, and opportunity yeah um, so we uh, what we do is we raise funds so every year we raise a, a fund that people can buy into and they buy basically a percentage of an LLC and then we take those funds and we buy we use them to put for the down payment of the house for the rehab and the staging uh, all the construction costs everything all the cash that needs to go into to getting that project up and going um, so the fund would buy, say, seven homes, and then the investors would own a percentage of each of those seven. Uh, we also give free stays to those investors that, um, you know, when they invest in that fund or whatever, which is kind of fun for them. Yeah. Um, but that way, we're able to share the, the profit with our investors, and they get involved in short-term rentals without having to actually manage them themselves. Because as you know, um, short-term rentals can can be a lot more work than just a long-term rental. That makes sense. So you guys are uh, getting capital, taking care of a lot of these different bits and pieces for investors to, to basically create a bit of a revenue stream for them. Do you guys have, when you guys get investors on, do you guys know what their return is gonna be and what kind of, obviously with investments, there's no promises that can be made. Um, and I, I'm going to put a purview of, hey, if you're looking to invest, then this is an investment advice. You've got to consider your own personal <laughs> circumstance. But before we, you know, what what's what are the numbers? What can you guys sort of um, commit to when people are investing with you? Yeah, um, so we try to be very conservative uh, in our estimations. Um, we, we give, well, we, we try to tell investors that we're going to give them, we give investors a uh, uh, basically a commitment of 10% on their cash. So if they invest 100 grand, then they get 10 grand a year back. Um, and then eventually we will sell the properties for a higher valuation um, and give them additional capital back. So if you look at the overall five year time frame that we're looking at, um, investors get, end up getting about a 20, 17 to 20% total return. Um, now that said, the returns actually are coming out to be higher than that. Um, but we'd never want to over promise and under deliver, but rather under promise and over deliver. So that's kind of what we're, what we're all about. Yeah. Gotcha. The, the other one was, uh, the scaling part of it. So, uh, I want to kind of maybe step away a little bit from maybe exactly what you guys are doing. Um, talk about creating USPs within property, but the way that you guys have gone about it and is, is definitely a lot more intensive in terms of setting up, you know, I can go from uh, five short term rentals to 100 short term rentals in a relatively short amount of time. But if I use if I try to go unique in this particular way and build out the brand, it's very, very um, intensive, especially up front, because you've got to get all the teams in place. And then you'll create a bit of a snowball effect, but you are limiting yourself to a number per year until you get more teams and that sort of thing. So, and it's a lot harder of a puzzle to, to build. Um, two questions. Are there any particular strategies that you guys are using to scale? And, um, and would you agree that there are some limits that you have because of this particular business model? hundred percent. Yeah. That's definitely something where we battle with every day is the scaling aspect of it. And creating these unique themes because it requires such a specific talent skill set. Um, so I would say number one, leverage technology as much as possible, uh, whether that be in the organization of the projects or whether that be in managing your managing your uh, rentals, just make sure that you're think you're using software as much as you can and, and automating and streamlining. Um, what I would say is number two, just, it's more of a mindset, but you need to think about everything that you're doing 
times 100. So if, if I had to do this 100 times or 1,000 times, could I still do it? And uh, everything we do, we try to push down, right? If there's another way that, that someone else, we can hire someone else to do this, then we, then we do that. And that comes at the expense of profits today, right? Um, you have to spend the money today for the, for the long term, but um, we find that it's, it's been worth it so far. Yeah, cool. All right. Um, look, uh, I think I like to keep these episodes relatively concise um, so that those that are listening can you know, listen to it in the car or just watch it online, get some great ideas and, uh, and have that in their, in their brains for the week. Look, uh, are there any final thoughts that you have for today? Particularly, I'd love you to sort of give some uh, a sprinkle of magic for somebody that's maybe um, got some capital um, that doesn't know quite what to do with it. What would your um, what would you say that they should do next? Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a perfect <laughs> question for us. Obviously, um, we. Uh, we love to help investors get good returns, um, and so we're we're happy to help anyone who's looking to get into short-term rentals to either um, learn how to do it. We have our own coaching course that we offer, um, but if it's something that you know you just don't, not sure if you want to commit to that level of work and effort, um, then we also have the investment option for people that can um, just invest passively as well. So um, that's what I would that's what I would advise. Beautiful. So thought for the day is get in touch basically and um, and reach out. And, and the good thing with um, Jeff, um, with Brindy um, and the team, it's that they will be able to give you some guidance based on their experience, based on what they've been doing and they've got different hats on. So it's a, it's a really well put together team. Um, as Jeff said, always consider your own personal circumstance and that sort of thing. These episodes aren't designed to tell you what to do. They are designed to give you some ideas and some thoughts that you can then take with you and then work on. Um, Jeff, I really appreciate you coming on and chatting to me and sharing some great insights. Um, as you can tell, we can unpack these topics for hours on end, um, which is awesome. It means that we, we like what we do and we're passionate about it. Um, uh, the course, uh, I know that there's a going to be a link in the show notes. So, folks, if you do want to take advantage of that, uh, just quickly, what does the course entail? What's what's in there? Uh, it's an eight module course. It's about six and a half hours of recorded training, and then we do some um, uh, in person. I shouldn't say in person. I should say uh, we do a weekly call as well to help our help our uh, our students. So. And then I think we get, we have a, a discount for your listeners as well there. I think there in the show notes should should show that. Yeah, awesome. And then obviously if you you are in the investment space, then at least reach out and and you know follow their Instagrams and Facebook profiles and that sort of thing, so that you'll be apprised of what's going on. Um, and once again to share some ideas. Um, look, once again, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Um, have a wonderful rest of the day, and um, I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. Wonderful. Thanks, Bart. Thank you.